members of the diplomatic corps, representatives of other political parties, students, members of the media, distinguished invited guests, fellow Ghanaians, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and assalamu alaikum. I would like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend and listen to this lecture on the current state of our economy. First of all, I would like to assure all Ghanaians that this lecture, as has been the case with all my lectures, will be based on an objective analysis of the data that we have in the economy. Ultimately, the data and the facts will speak for themselves. So, what does the data say about the state of our economy after eight years of economic management under the NDC with President John Mahama in charge as the head of the economic management team for four years and president for another four. Mr. Chairman, any assessment about the state of the economy and the performance of the government must be against the background of the amount of money or resources that has been available to, that has been at the disposal of any government. At a public lecture in September 2008, the then Vice President, Shell candidate, John Mahama, said, and I quote, to whom much is given, much is expected, end quote. I would like, with his permission, to borrow his exact words to describe his government's exact performance in the last eight years. In this regard, it is important to emphasize for the record that measured in terms of today's dollars and cities, no government since independence has had the amount of resources in terms of tax revenue, cocoa exports, gold exports, oil revenues, and loans as the two NDC administrations between 2009 and 2016. Under the eight years of the MPP government, from 2001 to 2008, taxes and loans only amounted to 20 billion Ghana cities. In contrast, taxes, loans, and oil revenues alone over the last eight years would amount to 248 billion Ghana cities. So, what you see in the diagram, in the graph there, the Mills Mahama government over the last eight years would have had more than 12 times the nominal resources that the MPP had, 12 times the number. The question, therefore, that Ghanaians should be asking is, how has the management of the huge resources at the disposal of the John Mahama government impacted on the economy? Let's look at the real sector. Mr. Chairman, a key statistic that measures the performance of any economy is its gross domestic product. This is the total income of the country or its total production. If the country were a maize farm, the GDP will be the total bags of corn that we produce every year. If the economy is doing well, we will produce more bags of corn each year. If, however, you can only account for a few bags of corn after eight years of farming, you cannot attempt to claim credit by saying that you used a lot of fertilizer. <laughs> 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 
if if in the presence of good rains you claim to have used a lot of fertilizer but still end up with a poor harvest you are likely not a good farmer Mr. Chairman, a second and just as important statistic is how many people in the country have benefited from the bags of corn we produce. Are incomes rising for all or just a few? Data from the real sector indicates the following developments over the last eight years and before. Between December 2000, Mr. Chairman, and December 2008, without oil, economic growth in Ghana increased from 3.7% to 9.1%. Without oil. After declining to 4.8% in 2009, real GDP growth increased to 7% in 2010 and 14% in 2011 because of the discovery of oil. However, since 2011, real GDP has declined steadily and drastically to 3.9% in 2015. Mr. Chairman, you recall that in 2000 we were growing at 3.7% when we were hippie. After discovering oil, we are pretty much growing at the same rate. President Muhammad's tenure of office, as can be seen in the graph, has been characterized by declining economic growth. And, and, and this is what you see. From 2012, 2013 coming down, you've, you've come all the way down. Mr. Chairman, between 2000 and 2008, the size of Ghana's economy increased from $5.1 billion to $28.5 billion. This was a 450%, 59% increase in eight years. Even in the face of global economic and financial crisis in 2007 and 2008, with oil prices reaching a record high $147 a barrel, economic growth, as I said, rose to 9.1% in 2008. However, the, notwithstanding the oil discovery, GDP has increased from $28.5 billion in 2008 to a projected $40 billion in 2016, which is a 40% increase in eight years. But you will see what is interesting about this data is that MPP increased GDP by 459%, NDC increased it by 40%. But when you look at the tenure of President Muhammad, between 2012 and 2016, Ghana's GDP has shrunk by 5%. So this is Muhammad as president. And this is the NDC. Mr. Chairman, under the NDC, GDP per capita, that is the income per capita, recorded, has recorded a growth of 17% in eight years from $1,266 to a projected $1,481 in 2016. This is with oil revenue. Under John Ajekum Kufuo, the story was very different. GDP increased by 187% from $440 dollars to $1,286 without oil. So ladies and gentlemen, you see from the graph that whilst under the MPP, per capita income increased by $826. The increase in per capita income was $826. Under the NDC, the increase in per capita income has been $215. So, <laughs> with 12 times less 
resources, the MPP increased per capita income by four times than the NDC. And if you look at this story, the NDC increased per capita income by only 215% or 17%. But under the tenure of John Mahama, per capita income actually declined by 12%. And this is it. It declined by 12%. Mr. Chairman, this is essentially the difference between competent economic management and incompetent economic management. It also tells us fundamentally that Ghana's problem is not about resources. Our problem is the efficient and honest management of the resources. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, let's look at the standard of living of our people. In dollar terms, Mr. Chairman, under the NDC government over the last eight years, the minimum wage has declined from $2.12 to $2.02. That is a decline in the minimum wage by 4.6%. Between 2012 and 2016, which is the tenure of President Mahama, the minimum wage in dollar terms has declined by 23%. In comparison, Mr. Chairman, the MPP under President Kofor increased the minimum wage from 62 cents to $2.12. That is an increase of 244%, which is what you see here. Mr. Chairman, furthermore, the data shows that as national income increased, in the 2001 to 2008 period, people at the bottom of the income scale became better off. In the period 2009 to 2016, however, as income has increased, those at the bottom of the income scale have become worse off. While the income inequality measured by the change in the minimum wage relative to the change in income improved by 1.8% during 2001 to 2008, it has seen a major decline since 2008, and the worst decline occurring during the tenure of John Mahama as president once again. So whilst you see the inequality, you saw improvement by 1.8%, under the NDC as a whole, you saw a decline of 2.8%, but John Mahama's tenure, during his tenure, the income inequality worsened by 5%. According to the United Nations Human Development Index, Mr. Chairman, which is an index which measures progress in income, literacy, and life expectancy, for the period between 2000 and 2014, the, uh, the Ghana made the most progress in human development during the 2000 and 2010 period. Now, guess which government was mainly in power in that period? The average growth rates of Ghana's Human Development Index has declined from 1.33 between 2000 and 2010 to 1.13 between 2010 and 2014. So not only are we doing worse off in terms of income, we are also doing worse off in terms of the measure of human development. Mr. Chairman, so you see uh, that agricultural output has also been on the decline, and this has been, and Ghana's food import bill has increased dramatically from 600 million US dollars in 2008 to 2.1 billion US dollars. And rice imports, for example, increased by 52%, 2.2% in 
from 395,400 metric tons in 2008 to over 600,000 metric tons by 2015. It's important that we, we, we try to understand what the minister is saying. He said that out of the $1 million euro bond, we just spent about $500 million and carried the remaining $500 million as buffer as we go into zero financing. So that when we have an uncovered auction, we are able to use the World Bank money, which we should have used entirely for domestic to get into that policy, <laughs> to ride on that policy. If you understand what exactly the minister is trying to say, <laughs> what the minister has admitted is quite unbelievable. You go to the international capital market to borrow at 10.75% and decide to pack those funds as idle funds in the Bank of Ghana <laughs> or maybe in UBA <laughs> Just in case, just in case you have an auction failure, so you will, so why borrow funds at such a high rate if you have no use for them? Why? Why borrow funds at such a high rate if you have no use for them? It is very bad economic management, pure and simple. The government simply used the bond proceeds to finance its deficit rather than refinancing the debt as it said it would in the prospectus to the bond issue. This undermines credibility. As a result of the lack of policy credibility, Ghana is now having to borrow at very high interest rates on the euro bond market. And it's amongst the highest in the world. And this is not only affecting government, it's also affecting the interest rates that the private sector are, is able to raise on the international market. Figure 15. This, the next uh, figure shows that when, the, when Ghana issued its first euro bond under the MPP government in 2007, the spread, which is the difference between the interest rate on the euro bond and U.S. treasuries of similar tenor, when we issued that first euro bond, the spread was only 3.7%. This spread is really the premium that investors demand over and above prevailing interbank interest rates. It is really a measure of a borrower's risk. The lower the number for the premium paid, the higher the credit readiness of the borrower and vice versa. The second and third bonds were issued under the NDC in 2013 and 2014 at higher spreads of 5.4% and 5.72% respect respectively. Ironically, our credit readiness has been decreasing since we became an oil exporting country. In 2015, notwithstanding a World Bank guarantee, the spread was the highest so far at 8.34%. Clearly, confidence in the management of our economy has eroded in the eyes of the international investor community as the years have gone by under the NDC's economic management. It comes therefore as no surprise that our fifth eurobond, which was rejected by the market when the government tried to borrow for 10 years, Today, as we speak, contrary to its stated objectives, government of borrowing long term, the government has been telling us, the minister has been telling us they are trying to shift the yield curve to the longer end of the market and they are borrowing long term, right? Today, as we speak, contrary to its stated objectives of borrowing long term, the government is now being, have, have, have now been forced by the market to borrow short to medium terms for five years against the stated objective. So today, Ghana has issued a bond in the London markets for $750 million for a five-year tenor at a price of over 9%. And, and, and so the spread, again, for the five-year tenor uh, is about 8%, 8 which is so high. It's, a, it's very expensive money. When we just got out of HIPIC, 
we borrowed for 10 years at 8.5 percent now <laughs> after being an oil producing country for five years middle income country we now can only borrow at five years but now for over nine percent did we come or did we go What we know is that Ghana attracted the highest interest rates on its borrowings amongst its peers in sub-Saharan Africa. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the price we are paying for mismanagement and incompetence under this NDC government. If you look at this, you will see that Ghana, amongst its peers, has the highest spreads. It's the highest spreads, higher than... <laughs> I, I think that was the president saying he wasn't by borrowing to drink tea. <laughs> he will borrow more. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, President John Dramani Mahama and the NDC government have also made several statements which have either turned out to be untrue or are contradictory. Either way, they have served to undermine the credibility of government and of its economic management team. These include the denial that government would ask for a bailout from the IMF, the promises to end do so, the flip-flops on ECG privatization, the promise to put cash in the pockets of Ghanaians, the denial that civil servants are likely to be laid off under a rationalization program to be implemented in 2017, the promise by, the, by President Mahama not to make any more promises. <laughs> so one is no longer sure what to believe. Mr. Chairman, we turn to unemployment. Mr. Chairman, the net result of the economic policies of the John Mahama government is that the resulting declining economic, the declining growth of the economy is the unprecedented joblessness that afflicts our people today and the apparent inability of government to find an urgent remedy to boost and produce the jobs we urgently need. Declining growth, doom so, high electricity and utility bills, high interest rates, the massive exchange rate depreciation, high government debt, which has crowded out the private sector, rising non portfolio loans, rising corruption, declining business confidence, and so on, have all contributed to high unemployment in Ghana. And the World Bank reports that youth unemployment in Ghana is 48%. The increasing unemployment in the country is a ticking time bomb, but the government has been bereft of ideas to create jobs. GIDA, for example, was used as an, a vehicle to siphon public funds and not for job creation. Mr. Chairman, as we approach an election year, the government has been trying to find explanation for this dismal economic performance. So we have now seen an engagement in a search for excuses. Mr. Chairman, rather than admitting its culpability for the dire situation of this economy, President John Mahama and the NDC government have resorted to providing various excuses for their failure. The excuses include the following. The NDC has argued that Ghana's economic problems are the result of the decline in the international commodity prices. Haven't you heard this argument? However, Mr. Ch Chairman, the evidence does not support this assertion. In fact, contrary to what they would have us believe, this government has benefited from relatively positive international commodity price movements for gold and cocoa. Very positive. Let's take cocoa. Under the NPP, that is between 2001 and 2008, 
Cocoa prices ranged between $965 to $3,021 per ton. The MPP enjoyed cocoa prices above $3,000 per ton for only one month in eight years. Under the NDC, January 2009 to 2016, cocoa prices have ranged between $2,113 to $3,522. The NDC has enjoyed cocoa prices above $3,000 for 42 months. That is more than half it's the time they've been in office. While the average cocoa price under the MPP was $1,729, the average cocoa price under the NDC has been $2,873, which is 66% higher than the, under the MPP. So they don't have a case for, uh, on the issue of cocoa. So let's look at gold. Mr. Chairman, under the MPP, from January 2001 to 2008, gold prices range from $260 to a high of $968 per ounce. Under the NDC, on the other hand, that is January 2009 to July 2016, gold prices have ranged from a low of $858 to a high of $1,770. While the average gold price under the NPP was $486, the average gold price under the NDC has been $1,317, which is 170% more than it was in the NPP period. The fact is that Cocoa and gold prices have been 66% and 170% higher respectively under NDC uh, and on average than the MPP. If with such low gold and cocoa prices, the MPP did not collapse the economy, how then can the NDC blame the much higher gold and cocoa prices they have had for Ghana's economic current mess? The crisis we find ourselves in today is not due to falls in commodity prices. It is due to corruption, incompetence, and mismanagement. <laughs> Amongst its peers in the West African Monetary Zone, who all face the same international commodity and external conditions, Ghana is the worst performer on macroeconomic indicators. For the third successive year leading to 2015, Ghana could not achieve even one of the six macroeconomic convergence criteria, such as inflation, external reserves, central bank financing, the fiscal deficit, tax to GDP ratio, and exchange rate stability. Ghana scored zero out of six and placed us last in the table of nations, including Gambia, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea, and Nigeria. Cote d'Ivoire, next door, which has come through a civil war after an electoral dispute, has, thanks to disciplined and prudent management, recovered dramatically. Its GDP growth was 8.4%, while inflation is 1.2% in 2015. Cote d'Ivoire is now the largest producer of cashew in the world, and its economy is being transformed dramatically. So, <laughs> The question that you, you, you have to ask is, if global, how can global phenomena skip Cote d'Ivoire and all the surrounding countries and only attack Ghana? How? <laughs> how? How does it happen? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, another excuse, another excuse that has been proffered by President Mahama for the miserable performance of the economy under his watch is the 2013 Supreme Court petition. You and I were not there. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, President Mahama claims that the election petition today, he is claiming that the election petition slowed down the economy. <laughs> the problem with this desperate argument, however, it is, is that it is contradicted by the data. That's why I like data. 
<laughs> Mr. Chairman, the table, the table on the screen shows that contrary to the claims by the president, except for the fiscal deficit, on virtually every single indicator, such as GDP growth, inflation, exchange rate, exports, eurobond interest rate, debt to GDP ratio, and so on, every single indicator, the performance of the economy in 2013 was better than 2014 and 2015. The president's argument, therefore, does not hold water, and the election petition cannot be blamed. Indeed, the Mahama government had the best eurobond rate of 7.875% in 2013, and that shows that investors in the international community had relatively more confidence in the Ghanaian economy in 2013 than in the years after. How the 2013 petition is the cause of the failure of the government is as explainable as the dwarfs in causing exchange rate depreciation. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, what is more interesting is that at the time of the election petition hearing, the president told the country that the petition had no effect on his work. In December 2013, after meeting with the Council of State in Nebri, President Mahama stated that his government will, and I quote, will transit from the first to the second gear in 2014 after using this year to lay a very solid foundation for the economy, close quote. So he is telling us that he used the year 2013 to lay a very solid foundation for the economy. And today, he wants us to believe that what he said then was not true. In, in fact, the evidence is that for President Mahama, if you look at President Mahama and his tenure of office, that for President Mahama, since he was sworn into office after the 2012 election, 2013, the year of the election petition represents his best economic performance. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I now want to turn to the very important issue of infrastructure. Mr. Chairman has touted its achievements in the last eight years in its green book in the area of infrastructure. They've built roads, water projects, hospitals, schools, and so on. The burning question, however, for most Ghanaians is that if this government has increased Ghana's debt from 9.5 billion Ghana cities to 105 billion so far, can they point to an equivalent value of projects? Unfortunately and sadly, the answer is no. The government is attempting to hoodwink Ghanaians by claiming a massive increase in infrastructure investment. Why do I say so? First, Mr. Chairman, if you sum the total cost of infrastructure expenditure undertaken by this government, this NDC government, the total cost from loans, from grants, from taxes, not just loans, loans, grants, and taxes, from 2009 to date. If you add all they have spent in infrastructure, it is less than $7 billion. <laughs> Meanwhile, the government has borrowed the equivalent, as I have shown you, of some $39 billion. So where is the rest of the money? <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. 
According to the managing director of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, most of Ghana's borrowing has been used for consumption and not for investment. The overpricing of contracts, corruption and the absence of value for money considerations are partly responsible for this. Ladies and gentlemen, I saw two I saw two identical teachers' bungalows in Dambai Teacher Training College this year. One constructed under the NPP in 2007 and the other under the NDC in 2011. They are side by side. These two buildings are side by side. The one constructed by the NPP cost 195,000 Ghana cities. But the one constructed by the NDC cost 900,000 Ghana cities. 4.6 times more. It's the same building, the same design, the same specification, on the same land, side by side. So what accounts for this huge difference? Another example is the runway rehabilitation in Kumasi Airport, which cost this country $23.8 million. Just the runway, rehabilitation, not a new one, but rehabilitation, $23.8 million. Whereas the proposed new airport with runway and buildings and everything in whole is going to cost $25 million. And it is on record that Ethiopia is building its share airport at the cost of $21 million. Mr. Chairman, the issue of the Ameri Power deal is one episode. <laughs> the issue of the Ameri Power deal is one episode of, of, of issues bordering on corruption and the failure to ensure value for money for the people of Ghana. In this deal, Ghana is basically purchasing 10 power gas plants for $510 million, even though the same plants can be acquired from GE, from the market, for $220 million. The government has claimed that the manufacturers of the plant GE would have provided the plant at more expensive at a more expensive price. How can the manufacturer provide at a more expensive price than the middleman? It's only NDC government that, that, that can try to convince you of such on occurrence. The situation of overpricing contracts through the use of sole sourcing as the procurement method of choice is very typical of this John Mahama NDC government. The amount, ladies and gentlemen, the amount of $3.65 million from oil funds was used for the rebranding of 116 Metro Mass Rapid Transit buses. Money earmarked for a supposed Osu Railway. Meanwhile, the company that actually did the work of employing Ghanaians to do the branding of the buses says it charged only 11,600 Ghana cities as the cost for the branding of all the 116 buses. So from 11,600 Ghana cities, we reached 3,650,000 3 um, uh, Ghana cities, 3.65 million Ghana cities. Egypt is constructing a 1,800 megawatt gas power plant at the cost of $1.3 billion. Abu Dhabi is constructing a 1,600 megawatt plant, gas plant at the cost of $1.5 billion, uh, billion. Together, a Mary and car power will cost Ghana over $2 billion over five years. And yet, they will give us only 550 megawatts of power. Mr. Chairman, the University of Ghana has acquired a loan facility 
of $217 million from the Israeli government to build a 600-bed teaching hospital at Lugo. $217 million for a 600-bed teaching hospital at Lugo. The cost of building a new 600-bed teaching hospital by the University of Ghana, however, is $30 million less than the cost of renovating and expanding the rich hospital from 200 bed to 420 bed. How possible is this? Indeed, given the resources at its disposal, one should expect at least four to five times the quantum of investment that the NDC claims to have undertaken. The close to 33 billion of borrowing that has not been used for infrastructure expenditure could have done so much in this country. If you take 33 billion dollars and ask yourself, what could you have done with 33 billion dollars? You could have solved the water crisis in Ghana. You could have solved our energy problems. Every region in Ghana would have had 1,000 kilometers of asphalt road. We could have transformed agriculture. We could have put in place a world-class hospital in every region. We could have bought a thousand ambulances for the Ghana Ambulance Service. We could have equipped our existing health and education institutions. And we could have built an additional 600 senior secondary, senior high schools that the government is trying to build currently. And we could have constructed the Accra Kumasi Paga railway line as well as uh, the Western railway line. And with all this, we would have still been left with some money. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the second reason why I say the NDC is attempting to hoodwink Ghanaians with claims of massive infrastructure investments is that the investment in infrastructure has actually been on the decline. Yes, investment in infrastructure in Ghana is on the decline, as I showed in a graph earlier. It is, ladies and gentlemen, the evidence shows that notwithstanding the massive increase in debt, the stock of capital expenditure as a percentage of GDP has actually been on the decline, and it has come down from an average of 11% during 2001 to 2008 to 5.7 percent. So you, you see this, this major, major decline in infrastructure spending from 11 percent average to 5.7 percent average. This means that contrary to all the government claims of an increase in infrastructure projects all over the country, the reality is that Ghana's expenditure on infrastructure relative to GDP is declining. The numbers indicate that government is investing about half what the MPP government used to invest. And this is a government that has discovered oil. But the government that did not have oil is investing twice as much relative to GDP than the government that had oil. Mr. Chairman, the third reason why I say the NDC is attempting to recruit wing Ghanaians with claims of massive infrastructure investment is that most, as I have stated, most of these investments are overpriced. Every project that, ha that it, it has... <laughs> Mr. Chairman, <laughs> every project that it has undertaken, that has, whose cost has been inflated means job losses. If the building of the teacher's bungalow in Dubai can cost five times more under the NDC than under the NPP, then it explains why the NDC kills jobs. It means that four bungalows could have been built if someone like Nana Kufuado had been president. <laughs> It means that four times more building workers could have been employed and earned incomes from that money that went instead to corrupt practices. It means 
four more, four times more teachers would have been employed and housed in Dambai. Ladies and gentlemen, leadership is ultimately about choices. One leader may prefer one village, one dam, whilst another may prefer one, <laughs> one chief, one car. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the fourth reason why I say that the NDC is attempting to hoodwink Ghanaians with claims of massive infrastructural investments is that, in fact, all governments in the past have done infrastructure projects. There is no government in Ghana including the military governments, all of them have done infrastructure projects. Indeed, in terms of projects accomplished relative to resources available, the MPP government of 2001 to 2008 under President John Ajekum Kufuor has a very impressive record. Very impressive. And I will come to that record shortly. Indeed, it was His Excellency President Mahama who told us in 2008 that any government touting infrastructure projects as its achievements is engaging in an exercise in mediocrity. So, what has changed? Ladies and gentlemen, the fifth reason why I say the NDC is attempting to hoodwink Ghanaians with claims of massive infrastructure investment is that infrastructure investment is not supposed to be for its own sake, but to increase productivity and production in the economy. The proof of the pudding, as they say, is in the eating. If you have undertaken massive infrastructure investment and unprecedented infrastructure investment, then why is the economy in trouble? And this is why I was saying much earlier when I began that if a farmer tells you that, oh, they've not been able to produce the corn, but they have used a lot of fertilizer, then you know they are not a very good farmer. The facts show that the impact of NDC infrastructure investments have not been translated to increased output, job creating, creation, better living conditions for the people of Ghana. It is like a man who has been given lots of money and decides to build a story, a big story building with no roof. Meanwhile, his children are hungry. He cannot pay school fees healthcare, electricity bills, and so on. And when the children complain, he tells them that he has laid a good foundation for them. In contrast, Mr. Chairman, in contrast, the MPP government in 2001 to 2008 undertook significant infrastructure investments across the country in several sec sectors. In the area of water, for example, the Cape Coast Water Project, Tamale, Adansege, Winneba, Berkese, Weja, Bafi Krum, Aquapim Ridge, Akimoda, Kufuridwa, New Tafu, Winneba Expansion, Kayak, Konyako, Bojoasi, Brimsu Dragon, Sekendita Kradi Expansion, Kumasi Expansion, East West Accra Interconnection. These are just some of the water projects. Then you have in education, construction of the campuses for the University of Development Studies in UDS, Yangpala, Navrungu, and Wa, construction of the Bolga Polytechnic, the Wa Polytechnic, established the University of Mines and Technology. 38 teacher training colleges were upgraded uh, to diploma awarding institutions. 56 model senior schools were started and 31 were completed. 31 lecture theater halls at various university campuses. The medical school at the University of Cape Coast was established. In health facilities were, were numerous. As I said, if you go to roads, the roads is a remarkable record. Accra, Yamuransa, Accra, Flao, Kejebu, Pepesu, Mansu, Asankragwa, Exim Jansun, Takwa, Abuakwa, Bibiani, Tinga Bole, Pantai Manfi, Pantio, Raura, Winchi Sampa, Tamale Yendi, Malam Interchange, Tetokwashi, 
Balam Jessica Mbokese Axin Jackson Tekwa Pantang Mamfi Tatakwashi Interchange Ashama Motowe Achimota Interchange Alajo Avano Asafu Interchange Ofanko Sawam Apejwa Bunsu Bunsu Enyinam Enyinam Konongu Konongu Enijusu This is just a sample. I have not finished. We built the West African gas pipeline, the Buri Dam. We, the construction of the 132 megawatt plant at Abuazi, the Takuradi T1 plant was initiated. 2020, the 220 Sunan Asogli plant was completed towards the end of the Kufua administration. We built Jubilee House, Flagstaff House. We constructed world-class stadia in Accra and Kumasi. We built a new stadia in Esipong and Tamale. Jubilee parks in all regional capitals. Accra com Tema Commuter Railway, Pedrosi Law Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation of Tamale, Kumasi, and Takuradi Airports. Mr. Chairman, let me make this point in regards to the rehabilitation of the airports. With Can during CAN 2008, flights flew directly from South Africa and Senegal to Tamale and took off directly. <laughs> directly. Directly from South Africa and, and, and Senegal to Tamale. This was in 2008. And today we are being deceived into thinking that they need to spend $100 million to fly pilgrims to the Hajj. Mr. President, of course, the key difference, the key difference between the NDC and the MPP, however, is that the impact of the MPP's infrastructure investment, along with the structural reforms and prudent economic policies of President J. Kufour, was felt positively in the economy. And let me tell you how it was felt positively. Positively, we saw an increase in GDP growth. This is what infrastructure investment is supposed to do to help you grow the economy. We saw an increase in GDP growth from 3.7% to 9.1%. Reduction in corporate taxes to boost business growth. A massive increase in cocoa production. The National Youth Employment Program was established. The School Feeding Program was established. Capitation Grant was established. National Health Insurance Scheme. Free Maternal Care. Metro Mass Transit. Introduction of the Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty. And yes, we were hippie and we were paying teacher training allowances and nursing training allowances. You also saw a massive expansion of the financial sector. Mr. Chairman, what this goes to show is that infrastructure investment alone is not sufficient to drive an economy. You need to manage an economy with competence and to keep corruption under check if you are going to make progress. So now that we have dealt with the infrastructure excuse, let us now go to yet another excuse that the President Mahama has been giving us. Mr. Chairman, another argument that the President Mahama has been making recently is that the last eight years have been spent building a good foundation, despite what he terms the, as challenges. In response to the reckless management of our country's economy and resources, which has led to Ghana back to the doorsteps of the IMF, the government has resorted to three parts. First, the government is imposing taxes on every conceivable item 
in an attempt to raise the resources to fill the fiscal deep hole that they had dug. In their desperation, taxes were imposed even on condoms and cutlasses, savings and investment, and so on. While existing, while already existing rates have seen increases, sometimes astronomic increases, taxes on businesses have increased dramatically and new taxes have been introduced. For example, we've seen an increase in the capital gains tax from 10 to 25 percent, withholding tax from 15 to 20 percent, introduction of the energy levy, 10 percent, VAT on electricity, VAT on financial services, VAT on real estate, special import levy. And taxes have also been introduced on ambulances and bus and bicycles. Secondly, the government has responded to this fiscal hole by cutting and abolishing all forms of allowances that are abolishable. So insensitive cuts have been included, such as research allowances to lecturers, nursing training allowances, and teacher training allowances. Thirdly, the government is also accumulating arrears in payments to contractors and other service providers. Mr. Chairman, the situation notwithstanding, the government's supplementary budget asserts that under the IMF program, there is a process of fiscal consolidation taking place with a decline in the fiscal deficit to 6.7% in 2015. But is fiscal consolidation really taking place? When the government received an IMF bailout, there was a clear expectation that the process of fiscal consolidation, which is a sustained decline in our deficit to GDP ratio, would take place. This, after all, is what IMF austerity programs are supposed to achieve. The decline in the fiscal deficit is supposed, therefore, to bring down inflation improve debt sustainability, lower interest rates, support the private sector activity, increase investment, and above all, increase economic growth and alleviate poverty. The only problem, Mr. Chairman, however, is that Ghana is experiencing a unique type of fiscal consolidation, which has defied all expectations. Ghana's fiscal consolidation is apparently taking place in the midst of unsustainably high public debt levels, inflation that is stubbornly high and is currently at 16.7%, which is the eighth highest in Africa, a rising black hole of state-owned enterprise debt, which together with the debts owed by government to the bulk oil distribution companies and the lack of adequate supervision of the microfinance companies can lead can potentially collapse the banking system. In addition, we have rising interest rates, the crowding out of the private sector, reduced business confidence, and declining economic growth. The Ghanaian experience is exactly the opposite of what fiscal consolidation is supposed to achieve. So if the fiscal consolidation is taking place, why aren't we seeing its impact on inflation, on interest rates, on economic growth, on investment, and access to credit? That is the, the, the mystery. Mr. Chairman, the IMF has stated that it has not concluded the third review of Ghana's program, which was expected to go to the board in June this year. Amongst the reasons that the IMF stated for the non-conclusion of the third review is that the fiscal data for 2015 is yet to be reconciled. This is a code phrase or euphemism for the possibility that the data is likely wrong. How can fiscal 2015 fiscal data, we are in September 2016, and you are saying that that data, as of September 2016, has not yet been reconciled. What is so complicated about that fiscal data? 
The Center for Economic Policy Analysis, CEPA, has pointed out that the fiscal data that the government presented shows that it has not accumulated any arrears as required by the IMF program. It, has also, it also shows that it has actually cleared arrears at a faster rate than initially programmed. And that compensation to government employees, that's the wage bill, exceeded what was budgeted. The question that naturally arises from this state of affairs is that if the deficit was not financed by expenditure cuts or by accumulation of arrears, then how was it financed? This is why SEPA believes, and I agree with them, that the financing shortfalls are more likely to have been financed by the $1 billion euro bond issued in 2015, along with the accumulation of arrears. Mr. Chairman, the 2016 supplementary budget has further muddied the waters by revealing a large unexplained discrepancy of 1.7 billion Ghana CDs in 2016, flowing over from 2015. It is a figure that the government has not been able to explain. There are books, there is a gap which you say is a discrepancy. And when they ask you what is this discrepancy representing $1.7 billion, you do not know. Should, how can, it is a figure that the government has been unable to explain. How can an amount of such a magnitude still be a mystery almost a year after 2015? What is the government hiding? It appears, Mr. Chairman, that even though this money that has, it, it appears that even though this is money that has been spent, the government is afraid to come clean because it will likely lead to a missing of the IMS perform, IMF performance targets. This should, be, should this be confirmed, it will mean that the fiscal deficit in 2015 is actually higher than what has been reported. This undermines the credibility of government. Arrears accumulation, Mr. Chairman, is the likely explanation of this discrepancy because the, because the report about rising non-performing loans in the banking sector due to debt not being paid by public institutions, which is being again driven by government's inability to pay its debt to institutions such as ECG, VRA, and so on. Mr. Chairman, I now turn to the issue of the public debt stock. By the end of 2008, following the adoption and implementation of the HIPIC initiative, the government's policy framework of fiscal discipline, the country's debt to GDP ratio had declined from 189% in 2000 to 32% of GDP by 2008. Indeed, from independence in 1957 to 2008, Ghana's total debt was 9.5 billion Ghana C. However, in the last seven years alone, under this NDC government, Ghana's total debt has ballooned from 9.5 billion Ghana cities to 100 billion Ghana cities in 2015, and 105 billion Ghana cities by May 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, 66% of Ghana's debt from independence, 66% of Ghana's debt has been accumulated under the presidency of John Dramani Mahama in just the last three and a half years. 66% of Ghana's debt has been accumulated under the presidency of John Dramani Mahama in three and a half years.
Ladies, Mr. Chairman, in terms of the dollar equivalent of the amount that has been borrowed, this government has borrowed some $39 billion in eight years. When I mention this, they either get confused or pretend to get confused. So, for the sake of clarity, I have put in this document a table that shows them clearly the dollar equivalent of all the amounts borrowed from 2009 to 2016. So you will see that you, you, you will see the dollar equivalent from 2008 of how much was borrowed all the way from 2009 to 2016. So this is where you are getting your 38.79 uh, billion or some 39 billion. In fact, by December 2016, the government will have borrowed by uh, 42 billion. Do dollars. The government will claim, no doubt, that the book value of the debt is $26 billion. So it would be impossible, they will say, that they could have borrowed $36 billion. Quite frankly, it is a weak argument. The only reason why the book value of the debt is $26 billion is because we are applying today's exchange rate, which the same government succeeded in collapsing to the value of the debt and not the exchange rate at the time the money was borrowed. Mr. Chairman, with this major increase in the debt, Ghana's debt to GDP ratio has increased from 32% in 2008 to 72%. The calculation of the debt to GDP ratio used by the minister is just plain wrong and misleading. The government has taken the total debt stock in May 2016 and divided it by the projected GDP in December 2016 to arrive at the debt to GDP ratio of 63%. This is statistical gimmickry. If you ask the minister, how he achieved this dramatic reduction in the debt to G GDP ratio in either January 2016 or May 2016, he will be unable to tell you. All that has happened is that he has used a higher projected GDP number to do the calculation. We know what the, debt, what the GDP was at the end of the first quarter. The government knows this. So all he should have done was to take the debt at the end of the first quarter, divide it by the GDP at the end of the first quarter, and he will get 71% of GDP, which is what we should be. But at that time, the at that time, the minister wanted to go for a sovereign bond, so he was trying to make the books look better than they really were. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, the real effects of the reckless borrowing undertaken in the last seven years is seen in the magnitude of interest payments Ghana has been burdened with, which has meant that vital resources we should have gone into sectors such as infrastructure development and social services are now being pumped into settling our debt obligations. Mr. Chairman, interest payments in 2015, interest payments amounted to 9.6 billion Ghana cities. That figure of 9.6 billion Ghana cities was more than the, the total debt stock of Ghana at the end of 2008, which was 9.5 billion Ghana cities. To put the interest payments in context, 
we should note that the entire allocations in the 2016 budget to the ministries of roads, highways, trade and industry, food and agriculture, water resources, works and housing, youth and sports, ministry of transport, all of these six ministries. The budget allocation to all of these ministries was only 2.1 billion Ghana seeds. But we are paying interest in 2016 of 10.5 billion Ghana seeds. As interest payments go up, the space for development shrinks. And this is all due to financial indiscipline. You will see that interest payments at the end of 2008 was only 680 million Ghana cedis. 680 million, not even up to a billion. Today we are paying 10.5 billion Ghana cedis. So you see, the dramatic increase in interest payments. And then again, ladies and gentlemen, you will see this massive jump in interest payments over the last four years has yet again occurred under the presidency of John Dramani Mahab. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the interest payments on the debt stock in 2015 was six times Ghana's oil revenue. The oil discovery has basically been compromised over the last seven years by the government's recklessness. Ghana's interest payments as a percentage of GDP has declined from 7.9% in 2001 to 2.3% by 2008 but it has now increased to 6.5% in 2015. Mr. Chairman, you see this again, this dramatic increase in, in interest payments as a percentage of GDP, again under the presidency of John Dramani Maham. The data also shows that during the period of MPP governance, Mr. Chairman, this is important. During the period of MPP governance, capital expenditure, that is expenditure on infrastructure, far exceeded interest payments. This is because low interest payments allow more room for capital expenditure. Infrastructure expenditure as a percentage of GDP declined sharply after 2008 as interest payments have been increasing. From 2014 to date, interest payments have now incredibly exceeded infrastructure expenditure. How can an economy grow when interest payments are higher than capital expenditure? This is the result of NDC's economic mismanagement. So you see it in the graph that capital expenditure has declined very sharply. And I'll come back to this capital expenditure issue uh, whilst interest payments have gone up and has now overtaken capital ex expenditure. No economy should be in this situation because you are only asking for trouble. Mr. Chairman, with such large-scale borrowing, government is also Government is also crowding out the private sector, which is unable to borrow to grow their business. Risk-free interest t treasury bill rates are around 23%, up from 10.6% in 2011. And bank lending rates are on the rise because of excessive government borrowing. Lending rates and financial institutions are now as high as 40%. Under the MPP, Treasury bill rates were reduced from 42% at the end of 2000 to 24.7% at the end of 2008, a reduction of 17 percentage points. Under the NDC, the Treasury bill rates have only been reduced from 24.7% in aggregate to 23%. That is a reduction of only 1.7 percentage points. This development means that it has become virtually impossible for businesses to borrow in the financial sector to grow and produce more. 
Government has today become the biggest competitor to private business and by its actions is squeezing the life out, out of them. I now turn to the exchange rate. Mr. Chairman, under the management of this NDC's government, the Ghana city has obtained the dubious distinction of being one of the worst performing currencies in the world. The city has depreciated from one, some 1.2 Ghana cities to the dollar to today 3.95 or almost 4 Ghana cities to the dollar. This is in contrast to the remarkable stability of the city during the eight years of the MPP government under President John Ajekum Kufuo. So you see from the graph the relative stability that you witnessed during the MPP era. And then suddenly from 2012, there's this massive jump up. Again, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, in terms of exchange rate depreciation, the worst performance between 2001 and 2016, the worst performance of the exchange rate has been between 2012 and 2016, during the tenure of John Dramani Mahama. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the energy sector has been badly managed since the Mills Mahama government took over the reins of government in 2009. The poor management of the sector has been characterized by generation shortfalls and corrupt procurement, frequent power cuts, inefficiencies, and unsustainable debts. Whilst the government is engaged in questionable power procurements, our dedicated state-owned power infrastructure from which revenue is generated by our utilities is collapsing. Akosombo has constantly been overdrafted, thermal plants are frequently breaking down, and all our plants operate below capacity. The poor maintenance and management of our generation plants have weakened the sector, further undermining long-term expansion, energy security, whilst the demand for electricity grows by 12% annually. Ghana's industrialization agenda is clearly under threat. We have maintained for quite some time that the problem in the power sector is a financial problem. But the government has kept denying it and it's taking them too long to face up to the facts. And in the meantime, they visited Dumsof on us for five years. Today, the energy sector faces an unprecedented financial crisis in Ghana's history. The, very existence of our biggest electricity generator, that is the Volta River Authority, is under serious threat, as its debts continue to increase. And VRA's debts are estimated to be between 1.5 billion and 2 billion US dollars. The cost of electricity to industry has been alarmingly high, and this has led to the collapse of some factories and the relocation of others to our neighboring Côte d'Ivoire. The problems of the energy sector have led to doom so, led to unprecedented devastation of our industries, particularly small businesses, job losses, deaths in our hospitals, disruption of life and destruction of electrical appliances of businesses and homes. And all of this cannot really be fully com quantified uh, or basically as very expensive. We have collectively paid a heavy price for the mismanagement of this government. Mr. Chairman, I now turn to the banking sector and how that is working. Mr. Chairman, Ghana's, as Ghana's economy has declined under John Mahama's NDC government, so has the financial sector become increasingly fragile and vulnerable, specifically Bad loans in the banking sector have risen significantly. Economic and financial data from the central bank shows that non-performing loans have risen sharply from 11 to a critically high 19.3% in May 2016. 
For example, the level of impaired loans in one of the largest commercial banks have quadrupled, and the situation is becoming widespread in the banking sector. Available information shows that due to non-payment of these loans, the banks have declared 2.4 billion Ghana cities of outstanding debt stock of loans as a complete loss and are making provisions against profits. Certainly, these resources could be channeled to create more industries in our communities. The asset quality review of banks conducted in 2015 shows significant vulnerability of banks to current economic conditions, and that if the affected banks were to fully provision for all the bad loans, a significant number of them will collapse. In fact, eight banks were identified to exhibit significant weaknesses with capital adequacy ratios of below 10% and some below 5% and nearing collapse. So it is a real problem. Mr. Chairman, real credit to the private sector has recorded negative growth recently. As of May 2015, the annual flow of credit to the private sector was 4.5 billion Ghana cities, or $1.7 billion. For the same period in 2016, the yearly flow of credit from banks to the private sector declined from the 4.5 billion last year to 1.7 billion Ghana cities, or around $445 million. This is the extent to which the private sector activity has been deprived. You see this major drop in credit to the private sector. Uh, and this condition is affecting the economic fortunes of many businesses, including the creation of jobs and, 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 and the growth to boost the economy. Making this bad situation worse is the inability of some public institutions to service their indebtedness to the banking industry. By some estimations, these public institutions are indebted to the banks to the tune of 4.4 to 5% of GDP. And this will require careful monitoring to avoid an explosive situation. The situation of poor, the poor state of microfinance companies is equally of critical importance given the role they play in our economy in supporting micro business. I now turn to the issue of policy, the loss of policy credibility. Mr. Chairman, one of the reasons the John Mahama government has given for requesting the IMF bailout was to help it regain policy credibility. Two years after the IMF program, however, the government's policy credibility is still in tatters, if not worse. The recent attempted Eurobond issue is an example of the loss of policy credibility. After four successive Eurobond issues in 2007, 2013, 2014, and 2015, the attempt by government to issue another Eurobond in 2016 was rebuffed by investors who have become increasingly skeptical of the Ghana story. So the government wanted to issue a 10-year Eurobond and basically it was rebuffed. The warning should have been on the wall when in 2015, even with a World Bank guarantee, um, for which we paid 0.75%, the Ghana, Ghana's bond was priced at a very high 10.75%. Without a World Bank guarantee and with the third review, third board review of the Ghana's IMF program in limbo, it was inevitable that Ghana would be asked to pay a very high price for the 2016 Eurobond. Mr. Chairman, several credibility issues have manifested recently. Firstly, the government appears to have reneged on its understandings it had with the IMF with regards to the recently passed Bank of Ghana Act and the Public Financial Management Act. It, this quite clearly is bad faith and undermines the credibility of government. If you read the IMF reports, when, uh, when they came in recently, they, they basically pointed to the fact that they had understandings with the government which were breached. There is also the big question of the use of the $1 billion Eurobond proceeds. 
the prospectus of to the eurobond issue clearly specified that the money was to be used specifically uh, was what the money was to be used for specifically the prospectus states that and i quote the republic expects the net proceeds of the issue of the issue of the notes to amount to approximately some 958 million dollars which the republic expects to utilize to repay outstanding domestic debt of the republic so it was very clear what this 1 billion euro bond was to be used for repay the outstanding domestic debt